one does not simply just make light. And that may seem weird, considering we've had the ability to command light production for a very long time. We started by making fires. After that, torches and candles. Those are just portable fires. Light, both inside and outside of the visible spectrum, is just a useful byproduct of this fire. Then came electricity and the incandescent bulb. These work by joule heating a filament until it glows. Just like with fire, the light is a byproduct of the heat. And while this was the most common way to turn electricity into light for many years, at about 16 lumens per watt, it's not very efficient. In pursuit of less wasteful electrical lighting, we moved on to fluorescent lighting, and more recently, to LED lighting solutions. So today, let's talk about LED lighting. Welcome back to Dad Explains Everything, the series where I talk about how stuff actually works. I've explained indoor air quality, VPNs, and even password managers. Today, I'm explaining the little glowing diodes that now dominate your homes, offices, streetlights, and cars. LEDs. I'll cover how LEDs actually make light. Why inventing a blue LED was such a huge deal. What color temperature and CRI mean for your eyeballs. Why LED lights don't last as long as the package says. How much money they save you, even on cooling. What LED lighting solutions you should avoid. And the sneaky things about LED lighting that you probably haven't heard. Let's start at the beginning. So how do LEDs actually make light? LED stands for light emitting diode. A diode is a semiconductor device, a little silicon sandwich that only lets electricity flow one way. When you make that semiconductor out of certain materials, gallium nitride, indium gallium nitride, aluminum gallium arsenide, and you pass current through a junction, something cool happens. Electrons fall from a higher energy level to a lower one. And when they do that, the energy difference is released as a photon, a particle of light. Unlike incandescent bulbs, where light is a waste product of heat, LEDs make light directly from electron energy jumps. It's very cool, and it's why LEDs can be 10 times more efficient than incandescent light sources. Even cooler, the size of the energy gap determines the color of the light. So a small gap produces red, medium gap produces green, and a big gap produces blue. This will matter in a second. Nick Kalaniak at General Electric invented the first practical, visible spectrum red LED in 1962. For decades thereafter, we had red, green, and amber LEDs. These were way more efficient and durable than light sources like neon and vacuum fluorescent displays. The problem was that we couldn't make blue. Without blue, you can't make white light. And for TVs, smartphones, and general lighting, you really, really need white light. In the early 1990s, a Japanese researcher named Shuji Nakamura finally cracked the code with gallium nitride. This dude was a straight-up legend and deserves his own documentary. His invention of the blue LED was so important that it won the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics. I also have to mention Asamu Akasaki and Hiroshi Amano, as their gallium nitride research was foundational to Nakamura's work. In case you're wondering why their work merited a Nobel Prize, the committee noted that lighting consumes up to a quarter of worldwide electricity use, and that LED lighting could reduce that by 90%. That's not just a scientific breakthrough. It's an invention that's reshaped global energy use, saving over 450 terawatt hours of electricity per year and avoiding an additional 200 million tons of CO2 emissions per year. Amazing. Anyway, from the moment we finally got blue LEDs, white LEDs became possible. How? There are two main methods. The first is the RGB method, combining red, green, and blue LEDs together. Your eye blends them into white. The second is blue plus phosphor method. Shine a blue LED through a yellow phosphor coating, and the mix looks like white to us. Either way, you need blue, but today most white LEDs you buy use the phosphor method because it's cheaper, easier, and scalable. So the next time you turn on a light, thank Shuji Nakamura, the guy who figured out how to make blue diodes glow. Like I said, an absolute legend. For a variety of reasons, not all white light is the same. It generally comes down to how it's put together spectrally. Color temperature is the color of the light emitted by a black body radiator. Well, LEDs are not black body radiators, but we still compare the visible light to the closest equivalent black body color. Color temperature is measured in Kelvin. Here are some common color temperatures. 2700 Kelvin looks like warm yellow, like an incandescent bulb. 4000 Kelvin is neutral white, like an office. And 6500 Kelvin is cool blue daylight. 
Want cozy vibes? Go for 2700K. Funny thing is, is that many people regard this as normal, but it's only because we got used to light from metal filaments that were so hot they emitted light. Want a murder mystery interrogation room? Go 6500K. It's worth thinking about other sources of light in your room though, as it does look pretty odd if you mix and match within an area. But color temperature isn't the whole story. The way we see things is a result of light that reflects off of objects. With natural sunlight, there's a large range of light wavelengths that are emitted, and therefore a lot that can reflect back from the items that they hit. The accuracy of a light source revealing colors compared to a reference source, like daylight or a black body radiator at the same color temperature, is measured with Color Rendering Index, or CRI. The standard CRI method uses eight test colors, which are pastel shades. The light source illuminates these colors, and scientists compare them against how they'd look under a reference light. The average of those eight scores is the CRI value you see on the box. The problems with this are that R1 through R8 don't include saturated red, deep blue, or skin tones. So a light can cheat the test, which is to say it can look good on paper, but make your tomato look brown. That's why you'll sometimes see extended CRI, which uses R1 through R14, which adds saturated colors like R9, which is a strong red, which is critical for skin tones, food, and medical lighting. R12, which is saturated blue, R13, which is Caucasian skin, and R14, which is foliage green. For consumers, R9 greater than 50 is generally considered to be good. Cheap LEDs often have R9 near zero. Alternative methods like CQS, TM3015, IES RFRG, GAI, and TLCI are out there too, but CRI is the most common denominator for consumer grade lighting. Why different LED light sources have different CRIs comes down to the spectral output. The light coming from an LED can have wavelengths for each of red, green, and blue to make white light. The light may look right, while still having holes in the emitted wavelengths making the reflected light from objects look odd. The cheapest bulbs use a blue LED with a yellow phosphor. The light is white, but has very little red in it. Generally speaking, the more expensive the LED emitter, the more complete the spectrum will be, resulting in a higher CRI. An interesting note is that red photons require lower energy transitions, and are therefore less efficient. A manufacturer going for maximum efficiency or brightness may skip red phosphors for those reasons and still end up with an expensive bulb. So, a CRI of 100 would be perfect color accuracy. Cheap LEDs may only hit 70 to 80 CRI, which makes your skin look gray and your food look depressing. 80 CRI is common because US Energy Star has that as its minimum requirement. Good LEDs, they score 90 or higher. That's why your living room lamp from Ikea sometimes makes your apples look like they're already rotting. It's not you, it's the CRI. Time to discuss why LEDs don't last as long as the package claims. Every LED bulb says something like, rated for 25,000 hours. That's about 20 years of normal household use. But then you install it and it dies in two years. What gives? If we go back in time, LED bulbs were new on the market, and they were very expensive. More expensive than incandescent bulbs, but also considerably more than the compact fluorescent bulbs that were popular at the time. The cost was high because white LED emitters were expensive, but also because the first LED bulbs were built like tanks. They had great voltage converters, heavy heat sinks, and quality capacitors. Those early examples may have lasted for 20,000 hours, maybe more. Then came the cost cutting. As soon as LED emitters became more plentiful and accessible, the LED bulb became an exercise in cost cutting. Half wave bridge rectifiers, dinky heat sinks, and cheap capacitors. So the LED chip may last tens of thousands of hours, but the cheap LED bulbs fail because they're baking in heat and are made with cheap electronics. Quality LED bulbs still exist, and they can generally be identified by the price. Philips, Sylvania, Cree, and GE are good brands, but that can be misleading since they split into cheap versus premium product lines as well. How much money do LEDs actually save you? Let's compare. 60 watt incandescents put out about 800 lumens with an efficiency of about 16 lumens per watt. A 13 watt compact fluorescent puts out about 800 lumens as well with an efficiency of about 60 lumens per watt. And a 9 watt LED also puts out 800 lumens at about 90 lumens per watt. So that's about six times more efficient than an incandescent. If you replace 10 bulbs in your house, you go from 600 watts to 90 watts. Assuming you run them at three hours a day at 30 cents per kilowatt hour, the incandescents will cost you $196 per year. The LEDs, $30 per year. It's 
it's $166 in savings per year just for 10 bulbs. And here's the hidden bonus. Incandescents dump most of their energy as heat. Your AC then works harder to remove it. LEDs reduce cooling costs, especially in hot climates. In case you're thinking, that can't be that big of a deal. Just know that the average human puts out about 100 watts of heat. Switching out those 10 can light bulbs in the kitchen can be the equivalent of removing an entire dinner party's worth of body heat. So what are some other things you should know? Dimmability. Not all LEDs dim well. You need compatible dimmers, otherwise they flicker or buzz. Flicker. Cheap LEDs can produce invisible high-frequency flicker, which can cause headaches or eye strain in sensitive people. The worst LED solutions flicker at 50 or 60 hertz, depending on your electrical grid, which is very visible. Many other cheap LED solutions flicker at 100 or 120 hertz, which is still not great, depending on the modulation. Better LED solutions use better drivers with capacitors or higher frequencies that fool the human eye into seeing continuous light. IEEE 1789-2015, a key standard on flicker safety, recommends frequencies above 3 kHz to avoid causing migraines, eye strain, or aggravating epilepsy or photosensitivity. Smart LEDs, like Philips Hue or Lifix. They can change color, connect to Wi-Fi, and they sometimes fail exactly when you want to show them off to your guests. Also, many keep drawing power when they're switched off. Environmental Impact LEDs use less energy but contain rare earth materials and plastics. Recycling them properly is better than tossing them. Outdoor LEDs are super efficient but bad for light pollution. Blue heavy LEDs can disrupt wildlife and human sleep cycles. Cities are now switching to warmer street light LEDs to fix this. Marketing lies. Daylight balanced on the box doesn't mean perfect color rendering. Always check CRI if color matters to you. Everything I've talked about so far has been about putting LED bulbs into conventional light fixtures. Certainly, there are advantages to that approach. It's cheap, quick, and easy. Literally a 30-second upgrade. LED bulbs are available for most existing socket types. You can keep your existing fixtures if you like. And it's perfect for renters or anyone who can't replace their light fixtures. The cons are that the size and shape constraints mean that LEDs may not perform as efficiently as possible. Older fixtures may trap heat, shortening bulb lifespan. Dimming can be inconsistent, especially with older dimmer switches not designed for LEDs. And the aesthetics. Bulb packaging isn't as versatile as integrated LED chips. The alternative is to get a new LED fixture. In the case of high quality or specialty bulbs like PAR 38s, a new fixture may be cost competitive or cheaper. The fixture itself is designed around LEDs. Instead of a replaceable bulb that has an integrated LED board with a driver, think of modern recessed panels, slim ceiling lights, or decorative fixtures with built-in LEDs. The pros are that the fixtures are often slimmer, lighter, and more stylish since they're not designed around bulb sockets. These fixtures are typically more efficient, optimized for heat dissipation, optical diffusion, and longevity. You often get better light quality, distribution, consistency, and dimming performance. And often the color temperature is adjustable too. And you can integrate with smart controls or advanced features like color tuning and motion sensors. The cons are that you can face higher upfront costs than just buying bulbs. Installation is more involved than just screwing in a new bulb. And when LEDs or drivers fail, you may have to replace the whole fixture and not just a bulb. And you have less flexibility if you later want to change the style or brightness. You're stuck with what you bought. So if you're doing a remodel, new build, or long-term upgrade, new LED fixtures provide better performance and design flexibility. But in short, LED bulbs are the gateway drug, and LED fixtures are the long-term lifestyle. So just to recap, incandescents made light by brute force heating. Fluorescents hacked it with excited gases. LEDs finally gave us efficient, tunable light. But not all LEDs are created equal, their lifetime is exaggerated by marketing, CRI and color temperature matter more than most people realize, and they really do save you money and keep your AC bills lower. Light has come a long way from fire, and while LED tech isn't perfect, it's one of the rare cases where the better, cheaper, and greener option is one and the same. Thanks to Shuji Nakamura, the invention of the blue LED gave us everything from smartphone screens to efficient streetlights. But it also gave us a world where choosing a light bulb means decoding a shelf of options that look like a magic decoder ring. The cheat sheet version is something like this. 2700 to 3000K for cozy living spaces. 4000 to 5000K for workspaces. 
CRI of 90 or higher if you care about how stuff looks. And stick to name brands because the $1 no-name bulb will die in six months. Now you can confidently say you actually understand how the Nobel Prize winning thing above your head actually works. So I hope LED lighting is sufficiently explained for you, or for the person that you're about to forward this to who's still using a slow start spaghetti tube compact fluorescent in their kitchen. If you found this video interesting or helpful, hit like, subscribe, and drop your worst lighting experience in the comments. Thanks, and may all of your lighting be accurate and bright. Have a great day.